Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Institute of Global Professionals. Those who regularly enjoyed our international webinar, I hope you have benefited a little bit through these webinars. We are trying to find the best trainer, speaker, and coaches from all over the world are able to present that they are very skilled. Hopefully, it will help everyone a little bit. We hope you are with us this initiative and will be in the future. We will evaluate and do something for those who want to learn. If we can help someone with our efforts, that's a lot for us. Our activities will continue if we get support from yours. The mission of this institute is to empower people from all over the world, especially the job seekers and the job holders, by providing effective training and consultation. For the students, the mission of Institute of Global Professionals is to empower them to better their lives and to contribute positively to the organization and communication in which they work and lives. We accomplish this by providing quality higher education. We serve students locally, nationally, and internationally through our respective campus locations and distance learning formats. Our sessions are conducted by globally renowned professionals. People who are joining with us, I am cordially welcoming you all. We hope that the webinar will help you to enlighten your knowledge in various sectors. Hope you will enjoy and stay with us till the end. We have already completed 33 webinars successfully. And our last webinar was Running Your Vision, uh, which actually suspended uh, for trainer urgency. Uh, we are extremely sorry for that. We will uh, reschedule it again. And we are presenting the webinar 34 on business performance culture. And today's guest speaker, Doug Kotsia, His purpose is to make the journey of becoming a market leader prosperous and joyful originally uh, from South Africa and a Dutch descendant. Uh, he is a coach and trainer with a vast international experience and he has based in Kuala Lumpur for the last uh, past three years. Honda, ALS, global market leader in food security on semiconductor carves international largest global fitness franchise for women and several more has participated in his performance coaching executive coaching business leadership soft skills or sales programs having experienced business from all angles as an out trainer and business writer he is in a very position to customize programs to suit business specific needs and make the training and coaching experience highly practicable and implementable his business leadership and business performance related article has appeared alongside industry icons such as dr john demartini on diverse platforms such as expert hub and entrepreneur mark he supports companies and individual access to develop diverse income streams, embrace change, and become market leaders, financial and non-financial. He has trained and conducted over 1 lakh people in seven countries. He is a qualified master NLP and life coach certified by the ABNLP, American Board of Neuro Linguistic Programming. He has co-founded several trainings, consulting wellness, <clears throat> Sorry, and performance related software companies as an entrepreneur. Long identity, he has actually. Uh, we are really happy to announce us like that. So, no more in my voice today. If you have any question during the presentation, please write down in the comment box. We will try to answer them all as far as possible. Today, we are happy to have him conduct this webinar. Let's welcome. Darth Kotsiasa to the Institute of Global Professionals. We would love to introduce today's guest speaker, Darth. Hello, sir. Hi, everybody. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me clearly. 
and thank you so much for the introduction. Uh, and a big thank you to IGP for arranging this uh, and allowing me to share my passion with you. And that is to help people to build a high performance culture in their organization. And that is what we will be discussing tonight in detail. This it would be a sharing session. It will be highly practical. Uh, you don't want to listen to my voice only for, for two hours plus. You really want to take part, you want to enjoy it. It's all about fun and learning tonight. The thing about a high performance culture is once it's there, once uh, the organization or business has a high performance culture and it's sustained, then the income of the company will increase and you will have happier employees that work together towards one vision. And that's what uh, tonight is all about. So if you don't mind, we'll really get into it. First of all, the flow of the presentation. We will discuss seven points to building a high performance culture, and that will be very practical. It will be detailed. You'll get to have a voice in this, a say in this, and we'll have fun tonight. There will be lots of polls and other interactions. I will ask questions to you. Uh, but no pressure, there's no test at the end uh, that you can fail, so no problem. There will be one five-minute break. I know for myself that coffee improves my personality a lot, and I hope it's the same for you. So there will be a break, and there will be a full 30 minutes right at the end to ask any questions. With that in mind, uh, I would like to ask you right throughout the presentation, Please take notes. Please write down your questions as I speak. I will be happy to elaborate, to make anything clear right at the end for a full 30 minutes. I'm so happy to be with you. And uh, first of all, before we really get into this, I wish that everybody is safe and healthy during this time of the pandemic. I don't want to mention the pandemic too much. I'm sure everybody's bored uh, uh, with, with all of the news, etc. But uh, we will also discuss how we can overcome difficult situations in an organization. So let's, uh, I said it would be very interactive tonight. So let's prove that and let's start with a question. So in the chat box, please answer. It's four questions actually. Take your time. I know there's a bit of delay on Facebook. So this might take a couple of minutes, but don't worry about it. We've got a lot of time. Please write down what is your name, where are you from, thirdly, what do you do, and roughly how many webinars have you attended during the pandemic. So it's four questions. What is your name, where are you from, what do you do, and how many webinars have you attended during the pandemic, roughly from February this year up to now. So use that uh, chat and please let's get it going. Take your time. I've heard that there's a lot of participants from various countries, uh, such as Bangladesh, India, Nepal. So I would love to, of course, uh, I would love to uh, get personally introduced to all of you, but there's a huge number of attendees tonight, which I'm very happy about. Uh, and thank you again for to IGP for all of this. Uh, but we would love to see, and I would love to read the chat afterwards to clearly see who joined and where are you from, what do you do, and roughly how many webinars have you attended. So keep it going. Right, so we have attendees from Nepal, we have attendees from Bangladesh. Welcome to all of you. And uh, one positive thing of this time, there's a lot of opportunity of learning, lots of time. Uh, there's a lot of webinars ongoing, but the key here is to make the best of it. So again, please uh, take notes. So without further ado, let's really get into this. Tonight, I will be sharing seven secrets of creating a sustainable performance culture 
This is for business owners, management of any organization or business, and the employees. Often, employees say, well, culture is the CEO's issue. Culture is top management issue. That is false. It is everybody's issue. To create a culture, everybody must take part. So don't say as an employee, I am powerless. I cannot influence. Tonight will prove that you have a say in the culture, that you can make a difference. And even if you have failed before and have no idea where to start, we all are human. We have failed before. We have tried to speak to people. We have tried to make a difference. And maybe we failed at it. But tonight will be very practical. I will make it clear how and together we can, we can decide how we can move forward to create a high performance culture. Here's two did you knows. Did you know that 50% of all businesses fail within the first five years? This is across industry. This is globally. 50% of all businesses fail within the first five years. Further than that, 96% of all businesses fail within 10 years globally, any industry. There's many reasons for that. There's external factors such as pandemics, uh, such as political climate, etc. There's a lot of external factors, yes. But people tend to neglect to discuss the internal factors that cause business failure. There's many, but one key internal factor is a sustained toxic business culture. Tonight, I'll also make it very clear what a toxic business culture is, because that is what we want to avoid. So tonight, we'll discuss seven secrets of creating a sustainable performance culture. I promise that you would be able to immediately apply after this webinar. So I don't want to talk too much about myself. Uh, the IGP also did a lengthy introduction to me, but what I basically do is to coach and train international companies towards becoming international market leaders. It's my passion to help people to succeed as individuals, as teams, and as companies. I'm an executive coach, and currently in Southeast Asia, I have uh, multiple MNCs, such as semi on semiconductor, Honda, and ALS, that I help to establish a high-performance culture. I've been living in Malaysia for the past three years, uh, and some people say that I'm a master NLP and life coach. Uh, to the Malaysians uh, listening to this uh, webinar, I just want to say your food is very sadapla, and um, I am, I might be a little bit Malaysian because I am married to a Malaysian and my son is a Malaysian citizen. So I have a bit of an identity crisis. I'm not so sure that I'm South African anymore. Okay, now let's really get into this. What is a performance culture? What is it? First, let's start with what is it not? What is the opposite of a performance culture? The opposite of a performance culture is a toxic culture. A toxic culture is where people work slowly. They have bad attitudes in general. They don't meet targets or KPIs. There's a lot of negative talking, negative attitudes. Meetings are very slow and troublesome. A lot of infighting in the organization. That is a toxic culture. Now, as I said earlier, a toxic culture is a big internal reason why a lot of companies fail. If you get the opposite right, a high performance culture, if you can establish and sustain a high performance culture as a team, as a company, that is one critical success factor uh, for a sustainable future for your company. So a high performance culture is a culture of committed and purpose-driven people that continuously learn together, they adapt to change, and they improve and strive towards real, realizing the company's vision, purpose, and goals. So that's a mouthful, that's a lot. But just think of it, when a team is really inspired, when they love working together, if they have common goals, when they share the values and they are truly inspired and excited by the company's vision, 
and they continuously learn and embrace change. If all of that is present, you would be surprised at what you can achieve as a company and as individuals and as teams. So just to summarize quickly, a high performance culture is the opposite of a toxic culture where people gossip, where people are slow uh, at work, where they come late for work, where they are often absent, where they uh, are negative during meetings a lot of the time, where people don't really want to work together. That's the opposite. A high performance culture is where people love working together towards common goals and a common shared vision. So now, tonight I will share the recipe of how, and we will work together on this, how do you create a high performance culture? Now, the first ingredient is an inspirational vision, an inspiring vision. Now, before we really get into a vision, we're going to do a poll. But before we do that poll, because we said we're really going to engage tonight, just really take part, please. Uh, I am a bit tired of hearing only my own voice and only reading my own notes, etc. I want to hear what you have to say. But um, my experience in working with visions, I have been working with many companies where the vision is only in top management's head. It's only there. It's the employees, when I ask them, what is this company's vision? A lot of them don't even know. Or some know it, but just intellectually. They don't know what to do about it. And they might not even think that it's possible to attain. It's often a beautiful written statement on companies' head offices' wall. We want to be number one in Southeast Asia. We want to be number one in the world even. That's a lot of companies that say that. Now, anybody can say it. I can say I want to be a world champion. You can say you want to be a world champion. It's so easy to say. It's a total different matter to make a vision practical, attainable. And that's what we will do tonight. We'll make everything very practical. So, but before I talk too much, it's about you. So, uh, please take part in this poll. Just use the chat. Put in the chat either an A, a B, or a C. Now, the question is, do you think your current company vision, whatever it is, we want to be number one in Southeast Asia, we want to um, be the most reputable company in the world, whatever it is, your current company vision, do you truly believe it is realistic and attainable? Just a bit of honesty here in the chat, please put down A, B, or C. I see my Facebook feed on my phone is lagging, so I can't see your chat at the moment. But let's interact. I will I will uh, look at the chat afterwards as well. But please advise whether you think that your current company vision is realistic and attainable. A is yes, most certainly. B not possible to attain. C, I'm really doubtful that it is possible. I'm not sure. I'll repeat the question one more time. Take your time in the chat. Put down A, B, or C. Do you think your current company vision is realistic and attainable? A, yes, most certainly. B, not possible. C, doubtful that it is possible. So let's take part in that poll. Uh, while you put down your, your option, it's either A, B, or C. Let's make a vision very practical. Now, as I said, um, I've worked with multiple companies in Africa, England, UK, uh, Malaysia, Southeast Asia, where most companies tell me immediately, I want to be number one in Southeast Asia. Or some of the most daring companies, I want to be a global leader. But when I ask them, what does that actually mean? What does that actually mean? What do I need to do to attain that vision? Often, that they, they cannot answer me, the CEO, and then if I ask the CEO, do you really believe that that vision is attainable? 
and I see some of them waver, etc. It's because the vision has not been made in a lot of cases very clear to everybody. Everybody in the team must know what the vision is. Everybody in your organization must fully understand what role they need to play to make that vision a reality. It must be in writing. It must be in action every day. So a vision is not just a statement up on a wall. A vision must become a discussion. It must be co-created by the whole organization. Everybody must be involved. Then you have ownership of that vision. If a vision is only handed down by the top management of a company, for sure it cannot be, or it's very unlikely to be attained because it's only clear in the, in the minds of top management. Example, when you create a vision, there's three things to consider. You can be the best in your industry as a company. You can be the most profitable and or you can be the cheapest in your industry, which can make you successful to a degree. If you sell things for very cheap, a lot of people might buy uh, volumes. Right, so you can be the best, most profitable, cheapest. But here's the thing you can only be two out of the three. So when you choose your vision, you can either be the best, the most profitable, or the, the cheapest. The cheapest in the sense you sell a lot of volumes. Now, let's take Air Asia as an example, but think prior pandemic, before the pandemic. Air Asia, for example, uh, might have been the best. They might have been the cheapest. Okay. You might hit two out of the three. That's what I'm saying. But you're unlikely to hit three out of three. So carefully consider those three elements of a vision. I might be the biggest. I might be the best. I might be... Uh, the, the cheapest. If I want to be the biggest, it's not necessarily true that I be the most uh, profitable. So you must be careful when you choose your vision. Then, okay, so the first ingredient of our recipe to create a high performance culture is have clarity of vision, make it clear to everybody, have everybody in your organization take part. The second ingredient is hire the right people. Hire the right people. Why do I say that? So many companies spend a huge amount of money on marketing, on sales, on their product, and then they don't hire the right people to sell that product, to make that product, and then ultimately end up in failure. It's key. It's critical to your success. I often say as a trainer, when I stand in front of people, if I stand in front of the wrong people, doesn't matter how good your product is, doesn't matter how good your or how big your marketing budget is. But if you hire wrong, if you hire toxic people, people with the right qualifications, but bad attitudes, for example, or are just there for the salary, no purpose, no vision then it, it will simply not work. So my advice is, and the second ingredient of a high performance culture is spend a lot of money to ensure that you hire the right people. There is AI out there that to a degree of 80% can determine whether you are hiring the right people. Uh, there's companies out there, several. Uh, I know some in South Africa that do a great job in ensuring that you hire people that would not only do the job, that would do the job to the best of their ability and stay there for a long period of time and grow with the company with the right attitude. And those people are priceless. We all know when the wrong people are there, what the effect is. You pay a salary to somebody that's not really into it, that's not delivering their best, that negatively influences others. So spend a lot of time in your HR practices, your onboarding practices, ensuring that you hire ethical people with, with integrity, 
that is one of the critical success factors. As Steve Jobs said, hiring the best is your most important task. Now, um, I will share two more slides and then we'll have a short break. Uh, in between, we'll also do another exercise because we want to keep it interactive. If not, uh, this bad bold man from South Africa will talk too much and you will take part too little. The third ingredient, we've covered vision and the second one was to hire the right people. The third one is be purpose driven. Be purpose driven. Purpose is the energy, the inner force that helps you as an individual and as a team and as a company to attain goals and the vision. As the famous writer Simon Sinek says, find your why. Why are you doing this? Purpose is the inspirational reason for you to go to work in the morning. I'll share a practical example. One of my clients, Maxview Vision, they manufacture contact lenses. And when I engage them, I always ask to engage the whole team because everybody is important in a culture. And I ask the team, what are you doing here? And they tell me, we manufacture contact lenses. My answer to that was so boring. If in my mind, I go to work and all I think about is I manufacture this or that, that's all I do. It's not really inspirational, is it? So the purpose is the end result of why am I doing this? So I advise them that what happens when people put, use your product, when they put in those contact lenses? What happens? They feel beautiful. They feel more confident. They feel more alive. They want to go out showcasing their beautiful eyes. So that's your purpose. You make people more beautiful, more confident. You're not just manufacturing contact lenses. And when the employees really took that to heart or those that did take it to heart, they immediately improved their performance. Because now, as an example, the picker and the packer, the picker and packer in the warehouse, when he packs those contact lenses, he thinks, if I do this wrong, my consumer, my end user cannot feel beautiful. If I put the wrong contact lenses in a box, shipping will make a mistake. They will send the wrong contact lenses to our clients. Then we defeat the purpose. My purpose as picker and packer is not to pack contact lenses. It is to make people feel more confident and beautiful. And if I really have that in my mind, I will make less mistakes. I will be more conscientious in my effort. So when they got that, they made less mistakes. If you are truly purpose driven, nobody has to ask you. Do your work, uh, work harder. You will do it by yourself because your work has meaning. You understand the big picture, the meaning, the impact I am making in society. So I can't stress it enough. Find your purpose, find meaning. There's great books out there. Uh, find Your Why by Simon Sinek. Uh, there's great authors on purpose. There's great YouTube videos on purpose. There's scientific steps that you can take to arrive at your purpose. Please look it up. Uh, make notes of it that you're going to search for your purpose if you haven't found it because the purpose is the energy. For example, my purpose is to coach and to teach. If this webinar was 2 o'clock in the morning, I would do it. And I would do it with energy because I just love it. it it's not work. Um, and I, I'm so happy and actually lucky that I found my purpose. Now, um, time for a quick break. Uh, let me just go back, make sure we did not miss anything. Okay, 
So just a quick summary before we take a very quick five minute break. Uh, thus far, we have discussed three ingredients of a high performance culture. The first one is have an inspiring vision. Now, if your company, if you are an employee and your company does not have an inspiring vision, and you try to speak to top management and they don't listen to you, nothing prevents you from having a personal vision. What do I want to create for my life, for my family? What am I truly after? I often advise my individual coaching clients, record your vision on a video, record your purpose on a video, watch that video every morning or record, do a voice recording. Listen to it because the thoughts that you wake up with in the morning are the ones that you go to work with. If you go to work being truly inspired by purpose and vision and your value system, then you'll make an impact. You'll make a difference. If you just wake up, oh, another day, my body is sore. Uh, I don't want to go to work. Oh, I have this difficult meeting. If that's your attitude, often you'll have a bad day. But if you truly have your vision in your mind as you go to work, your, your purpose, your goals, you might just have a better day more often. So thank you so much. Uh, I've shared three ingredients thus far. Hire the right people, have a strong and clear vision, and be purpose-driven. Uh, after the break, uh, I mean, Again, write down your questions. Uh, I will answer any questions that you might have for 30 minutes right at the end. And in that discussion and sharing, we can also make it more practical for you. How do you actually uh, build your purpose if you don't know where to start? Uh, unfortunately, we only have two hours tonight. Uh, this is a whole course by itself that I am putting into two hours. So I can't share everything, unfortunately, but happy to give you practical answers right at the end. So in this five minutes break that we're taking uh, now, as soon as I stop talking, uh, please write down some questions. Uh, I'm still not able. Uh, I see my Facebook is hanging on my phone. I'm still not able to access the chat, but please keep that chat uh, alive. Uh, we can always access it after and I can give some feedback. In the meantime, please write down your questions. And for now, we'll take a five minute break, exactly five minutes. Um, it's now uh, 33 minutes past seven, uh, uh, 34 minutes. So we'll start at 7.39. Please be ready uh, to start listening in at 7.39. Have some coffee. Uh, I know coffee is very good for my personality. It improves your personality, whatever. Just walk around, spread your legs. Uh, go for it and enjoy. Five minutes break. Thank you so much.
Okay, our, our five minutes are over. If, if you can uh, just give me indication if we are online, everything is fine. Our five minute break is, is done. Time for action again. So welcome back uh, quickly again. We after a joint vision, an inspiring vision, an inspiring purpose, and also hiring the right people. That is the three secrets I've shared thus far. There's four more to come. So let's go for it. The next ingredient, ingredient number four, is to co-create a shared value system. Now, again, I've seen it so many times. You walk into the company's head office, any company in the world. It could be in England. It could be in South Africa. It could be in India. It could be in Malaysia. Often, you would see this beautiful poster of their values, of their vision, their mission, their purpose. But here's the, the issue. The problem is often when you ask any employee, and I have a habit of doing it, I go to the receptionist. I, when I walk in the hall of the company uh, head office, I ask any employee that I come across, what is your company values? And often they can't even answer me. Did we even have it? It's because values must be made practical. It's not just words. So words such as respect, honesty, integrity, so easy to use them. But is it really a practice? If you want to have a high performance culture, if you truly want to be number one in your industry, you must put those values into daily practice. You must hire for those values. You must even fire for those values. If people don't follow your values, because values is what your family is made of. It's what keeps you together. All of us should have integrity. All of us should respect each other. All of us should be customer centric if we truly want to succeed. And those that are not, well, we can coach you, we can help you because we love people and we don't want to see people leave. But if you want a sustainable high performance culture, everybody must act according to the values of the company. And if not, maybe it's time to go to another company. There's a culture in general of not firing people. Jack Ma famous, famously fired his top salesperson, top salesperson bringing in millions into the company for not following the values of the company. Because if you don't, the company will fail at some point. Because if you as a salesperson, even if you are top, you bring in millions, you lack integrity, you follow backdoor policy, you break promises, you take bribes, for example, then sooner or later the company will fail as a result of it. So that's how important values are. Uh, value of integrity. Most companies have that value. So what if it's up on a wall? Does every person in your business have integrity? So please make a note of this. I have integrity when I, and you fill in the rest, do what? It's a doing. It's not just a word. Anybody can say I have integrity, but what are you doing to prove that you have integrity? My advice, have everybody, if you are a business owner, or, or even if you just have four employees, if you are in top management of a big company, have everybody, every person, yes, the receptionist, yes, the cleaners, write down what those values practically mean in their role. I, as receptionist, have integrity when I always answer every email, every phone call, and speak the truth over that phone. When I always relay the messages in the correct way, uh, if I never lie, if I never um, hide anything, 
hide my mistakes. Hiding my mistakes is also a lack of integrity. But be very practical about what those words mean. I would, uh, companies that I consult for, I always advise even have those values in your job descriptions. Have a practical description of what you must do to ensure that you live that value, that you are a living example of that value. If not, it has no meaning whatsoever. It's just a statement on a wall. Now, top companies in the world, what makes them different is that they live those values. They are it. Now, here's the thing about culture. Culture is not what you say it is or what you think it is. It is what you do. What you do together as a team, what you do daily is your culture. So if you want to see what a business culture is like, go to that business and observe their behavior. That's their culture. Not what's on a poster, not what people say or think, the reality of their actions. So respect, for example, if that's one of your values, must be uh, visible. It must be an action. So an example would be, I respect my fellow co-workers when I greet them in a friendly and professional way every single morning. I never say anything bad behind their backs. I respect them by doing my work to the best of my ability so that I'm a, a truly respectful team member. That's just an example. However you decide to define those values, it's critical that you do. Often, Business owners or top management or the CEO just tells the employees what the values are. That would often not work because you feel as an employee, I did not help create these values. I had no say. So then it's not really shared. So share those values, co-create it, get everybody involved. When I help establish a performance culture, when I do consulting, that's one of the first things I do. I get everybody, the whole team in the room, and we create those values. If they already have a value system as a company, then we make it practical. I have to do these things to show that I have respect, and we decide together what they are, and then we do them. Then values are so powerful when it becomes action. So the fourth ingredient of a performance culture is to co-create a shared value system. There's a wonderful exercise that actually uh, coaching and training is in my blood that my father created that I've been using for 20 years on how to co-create values. And people feel that togetherness when they share the same values. When you walk into a room, of people that share the same values as you, you feel comfortable immediately. When you walk into a room and you're not sure what the people's values are, what they stand for, how they think, then you feel uncomfortable. So in a company where everybody's comfortable with each other, where they work together towards same, the same goals, they do share values. The fifth ingredient of a performance culture is that your company goals must be integrated with the value system. So different companies, different individuals have different ways of setting goals. And there's virtually no wrong or right here. People still use the smart or the smarter system to create goals. Goals must be specific. It must be measurable, etc. We all know the drill, but goals have no meaning if they are separate from your value system. Let me make this clear. So again, my example of Jack Ma that fired his top salesperson in public for not having integrity. So if I have a sales target, that's one of the goals of 1 million per month, for example, it has to be integrated with the value of integrity, for example. I have to achieve the goal of 1 million uh, still maintaining the value of integrity. 
So no backdoor policy, no lying, cheating, stealing to make that million. I have to do it with integrity. So always when you set goals for yourself and your company, ask yourself, how can I achieve this goal with the value systems? Maintaining my integrity, being respectful, being a team player, if that's a value, and being customer focused. Always have your goals and your values together. It's one system. So your vision, your purpose, your values, your goals is part of one system. It's never separate. If it's separate, you immediately have a culture problem. At all costs, I maintain my goals. I achieve my goals. At the cost of my integrity, I will still go after my goals. Then you have big problems. That's why those values must have practical meaning. I'll share an example of a company that I've done consulting for. I won't name the name. Uh, they, they're very keen on their privacy. But they take their value system extremely seriously. And one of their values is integrity. So if you display a lack of integrity, you are very likely to be fired. They take it extremely seriously. They talk about integrity at every meeting before the meeting even starts. They say, how can we conduct this meeting with integrity? Even your meeting should be filtered through your value system. So when you start a meeting as a manager, ask everybody in the room or tell them this meeting we have to conduct with integrity. We have to respect each other. Remind them of the values should be constant reminder because it has to be turned into action. So let's do a quick audience poll. So in the chat, I'll give a minute or two. In the chat, before we discuss KPIs, and after this, I'll do a quick uh, summary. Before we discuss KPIs, um, quickly tell me in your belief, no right or wrong, it should be co-created by all involved. So, for example, if I have a sales KPI, should I include everybody to create that KPI that's involved in achieving that target? Production is involved, for example. If not enough units is produced for me to sell, I cannot hit my target. So, should a KPI be co-created by everybody involved in that KPI? That's A or B, should be created by top management only. So A, you are say, if that's your choice, the KPI, everybody should be as, have a say in it, what it should be, it should be co-created and decided together what it is, or B, it should be created by top management only, and employees should be just told what it is. Uh, unfortunately, Facebook on my side still hanging, so I cannot see your comments, but please keep it active, A or B. Uh, keep it interactive. Tell us what you think. We'll look into that chat uh, straight after to see. It will be very interesting to see your thoughts. Please share with us. A, KPIs should be co-created by all involved. Everybody that has a part to play in achieving that KPI, project, production, it could be admin, if they process slowly, if they process the information slowly, I or invoice slowly, I might not hit my target. Or B, should purely be created and uh, handed down by top management only. So take your time, keep the chat alive, A or B. Still trying to get into the chat, but no, no concern. If I can't, just keep it alive, keep it going. We want to see what your thoughts are, A or B. I'll just give you a few seconds to complete that, A or B, in relation to KPIs. No wrong or right, but I'll just share my opinion. If you want to achieve KPIs, 
and some companies have tons of KPIs. For KPIs to be effective, should be three to four per role. They can be interdepartmental and shared KPIs. Uh, they can be company KPIs, they can be OKRs, OKRs, objective key results, uh, made famous by Google. If your company wants to use that, use that, that's more for strategic purposes. But KPIs for individuals, I believe, personally, to be effective should only be three to four. More than that, it's overkill and people lose focus. But the three to four key drivers of performance in their role should be their KPIs. And it should be co-created by all involved. That's my opinion. Then it makes it stronger. Everybody knows what their role is to achieve that KPI and how to support each other. And it helps people to take ownership of their KPIs because I had a say. If I had a say in creating that KPI, I am more likely to take ownership of it, to go after it. Some uh, companies, it's purely handed down by top management, no wrong or right, but uh, it's just my belief, and I've seen it so many times, that uh, then employees don't believe that it's attainable, it's, sometimes it's unrealistic, I didn't have a say, they didn't hear my part in it, uh, then it can be unrealistic and very hard to achieve. That's just my opinion. Uh, whatever you believe, A or B, up to you. Let's uh, quickly go into a discussion of, of KPIs. You have to lead and manage and coach performance. I will go into quite a lengthy discussion on this because performance just doesn't happen by itself. You have to have leaders in your organization, a lot hopefully. They can lead people in an inspirational way and managers that can manage day to day. You have to become a coach to your employees and then they can perform. But before I go into that, and that's going to be quite a lengthy discussion, I have a question for you. What is the difference between leadership and management? Please keep the chat going. Uh, what is the difference between leadership and management? If you think there's no difference, also up to you, no wrong or right tonight, there's no test. But what is the difference between leadership and management in your mind? Uh, still, my Facebook is hanging, unfortunately, but I would love to read your comments after this uh, to our session. What is the difference between leadership and management? I'll give you a minute or two just to write down your comments in the chat. Just keep it short. But what is the difference between leadership and management? I'll give you a minute or two, and then I'll just give my opinion. Some believe that leadership and management is the same thing. There's no difference. Some believe there's a very big difference. And some think you can be both and that it's situational. Sometimes you need to lead, sometimes you need to manage, for example. So I'll just give you a minute more. Please write down your comments in the chat. What is the difference between leadership and management? A minute more and then I will just share my thoughts and then I will go into uh, a bit of a discussion on how to coach, manage and lead your employees. Performance, people, not going to happen by itself. It's not going to fall from the sky. It has to be led, coached and managed. It's one of the secrets of a high performance culture. Companies such as Apple, et cetera, have a very strong high performance culture because they have a very strong vision value, values as well. It's not purely about their product. Product, of course, important, but if you have a strong vision that everybody's inspired by, if you have a strong purpose, if you share values as a team, 
If you have strong goals and you are led, managed and coached to achieve those goals, you have clear KPIs that you had a say in, you, had clear, you have clear goals, you are likely to perform extremely well. It's not only about the quality of your product and if you spend billions on marketing. There's a lot more critical success factors in business. So I hope you have had a chance to write down your comments. What is the difference between leadership and management? I will say this quickly. I personally believe uh, from experience, from the perspective of my experience, that leadership and management is not the same thing. To keep it simple, this is a course by itself, what is leadership and what is management. But to keep it very simple for the purpose of this discussion tonight, I will say that, the, that leadership is the ability to inspire people and management is the ability to control people. And you need both. I'll say it again. In my opinion, a very brief explanation is a huge, long, vast explanation of what leadership and management is, but a very brief explanation of what leadership is and what management is. Leadership is the ability to inspire people and management is the ability to control people. If your company lacks leadership, the ability to inspire people, people will run out of energy. They will be tired all the time. There's no inspiration. It's just work, work, work. But if there's true leadership, true leaders inspire, like Nelson Mandela inspired a nation, Mahatma Gandhi inspired a nation. True leadership is what you say, what you do, you do with inspiration as an example. The words from your mouth must be positive and uplifting so that you, and, and spoken with purpose, integrity. You must be an example of the vision, the values, the purpose of the company. Then you will inspire others to act. That is leadership. Management is to control people the day to day. Tell them what to do, how to do it, uh, when to do it, um, to do the paperwork, etc. To process. That, that is management. Day to day running of the business. It's two different things, but both is needed. Let me elaborate on that. When you only have strong management, day-to-day -day controls, but you lack leadership, inspiration, the energy will fade. It won't be there. You'll have big problems in the long run. If you only have inspiration, you have strong leadership, but no day-to-day -day controls, your business will be chaos. So it's not a question of do I lead or do I manage? I need to do both. It's when to do it. When do I inspire people and when do I control them? That's a fine balance. That's a course on its own. Maybe, hopefully, if I do another webinar in the future, maybe we can do one on this. What, what is leadership and what is management and how do I make sure to maintain that balance? That's a very good subject. But that's my opinion. Uh, when I coach or train companies to install a high performance culture i make it very clear what do leaders do they inspire people there's many other things that they do they inspire people and management controls people and i i ensure that both is there in the company so that they can be successful but let's go back i said we had a we would have quite a lengthy discussion on uh, leading managing and coaching performance so I have to inspire people, that is leading them. How do I inspire people? By being an example of the vision, I need to live those values as the leader. I have to be a very clear and practical example of integrity, of respect, if those are the company values. I can't ask employees and my team members to be respectful, to have integrity if I don't have it. I have to be a practical example of it. I have to go through the same things as my employees do. I have to show them by action that I am serious about this vision. I, a leader cannot speak enough about the vision and the purpose of the company. A leader must go to work with energy and show them that I have purpose. My purpose is to inspire people. I am here to lead you. If that is what I love, I show people that I'm leading. 
Managing is having KPIs, goals, controls in place, financial controls, in manufacturing safety controls. Uh, that is managing. And then I want to spend a decent amount of time on coaching performance. Now, here's an example. Uh, I was quite shocked. Two years ago, I saw a Harvard study that proved that internationally, most managers are just bad at coaching their employees. Most business owners are just bad at coaching their employees. And then I read further, the study detailed why are they bad at coaching their employees and team members. The top reason is because they tell people what to do and people don't like to be told what to do. If your management style is just tell people do one, two, three, four, go and do it now. That will lead to trouble, especially with the millennial generation and younger, because they simply, in general, do not like to be told what to do. Again, why? Because when they grow up, their teachers tell them what to do. At home, their parents told them what to do. When they went to university, the lecturers told them what to do. And then when they go to work, managers tell them what to do. The boss tells them what to do. Um, there's so many people, so many avenues of life where they just get told what to do. So they don't want to hear that at work as well. They want to be inspired to do. They want to be managed to do.
So share your slide. Uh, so I just want to be clear. Uh, everybody heard me up to about five minutes ago. Kaushik, are you there? Yeah, five minutes everybody ago. Everybody heard me up to about five minutes ago. Yeah, five minutes. Uh, so what is the last uh, that you heard me so that I can just continue? Mm, sorry, sir. <laughs> I was busy. Okay. Just go. Uh, can you see it now? No. Okay. Okay, I'm back at share your screen. Application window. Then click on screen, uh, screen then share. Okay, just. Okay, can you see now? No, make it full screen. Sorry? Make it full screen. Uh, first, uh, this is not in uh, full screen, so stop share and stop share. Yes. And then first of again, uh, open your slide in, uh, open your slide and make it full screen. Okay. Then go to the Chrome browser. No, 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 no. Can you see? No, this is your entire screen. Okay, just uh, take me through it again. Yeah. So I went stop sharing. Open your slide and make it presentation mode. Okay. Then go to yes. then share a screen. If I do that, then um, I, I have to press escape to go back. Yeah, you have to open the Chrome browser, which is stream where you have. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I'm struggling here. Yeah. You already did yeah. that. Yeah, I know, but uh, doesn't allow. So I'm at share screen. I'm at application window. Then click on your screen, uh, your PPT, then share. Okay.
Okay, fine now. This is okay. 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 Uh, so I can just continue. Sure. Can I just continue? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, apologies, everybody. You see, have seemed to lost me. I don't know what went wrong there. Uh, if I'm correct, uh, you didn't hear me for the last uh, five minutes. So I'll just quickly summarize. You have to lead, manage, and coach performance. Uh, coaching performance is all about the right questions, the intent that you set before your coaching session. If you are positive in your intent, non-judgmental, uh, you don't accuse somebody unless they truly did something extremely bad. You just ask positive questions to help them to perform. Positive questions leads to positive answers. What can we together do together to improve your performance? What is it that I can do to help you to attain your KPIs? What help do you need from other employees? What coaching do you need? What training do you need? Those are more positively inclined questions that can help you. But the, the tip here is you have to inspire people, you have to manage them, control them, and coach them. Often have coaching sessions, training sessions with your employees, create a positive feeling and environment. Last thing that I want to say about that is people don't remember what you've said. They remember how you made them feel. It's, therefore, it is critical to ask positive questions. Positive questions that, so that they feel good, so that they can perform. That leads me to the last part of the, the discussion. It's all about clear communication. Now, my, in my experience, HR managers or HR consultants don't even ask companies anymore if the or employees in companies if the if the communication is good because most employees globally complain that the communication in the organization is poor. It's unclear. Now, here's something that research has proven. The most common factor in employees resisting change, meaning the CEO, the top management says, we are going to change, we are going to do things differently, and then employees resist that change. They are negative towards that change. The most common reason is lack of clarity of information. If I am not clear on what I need to do, what my role is, if I am not clear what's expected of me, if I am not sure what to do, I am not going to act well. I'm not going to understand what to do. So in your company, constant, frequent, clear, and inspirational communication is a requirement if you seek to have a high-performance culture. That is a basic requirement. Now, most of us globally manage by meetings. We as managers have a lot of meetings. As employees, we attend meetings. Now, here's a common mistake in communi communication when we have meetings. In meetings, it's usually one or two people that do most of the talking and the rest just nod their heads in agreement. They do this. But here's the problem. We think as managers or as leaders that this, nodding your head, means yes. I've got bad news for you. In most cases, this does not, nodding your head, does not mean a yes. It actually means this I do to make you stop talking. Think about it. Just agreeing with everything in a meeting, it's the quickest way to make the, the one that conducts the meeting stop talking. So please, that's, that's not communication. Uh, next time when somebody not just nods their head when you're speaking in a meeting, ask them, what are you agreeing to? And you will be surprised. Most of the time, they will ask you to repeat yourself because nodding your head all the time, mostly they don't even listen. Most meetings are totally useless. Meetings should be two, three-way, four-way communication. Ask questions during the meetings, then you get answers. 
establish a culture where everybody is involved in meetings. Everybody has a say. So when I uh, own my own companies, I would have uh, meetings standing in a circle, handing um, around a baton. Only the person with a baton can speak. Everybody else must listen and you can ask questions. It was always highly interactive meetings. Then you can understand if your employees, your team members understand. So the last ingredient of, that I want to share tonight of a high performance culture is clear communication. Listen to people, give them the opportunity to speak, ask questions. In meetings, let everybody participate. If not, um, it's an autocracy, it's, it's a problem. Then you don't know if others understand or if they get it. A critical tool in communication. Communication by itself is a course, so I, I cannot share everything, but I'll share one critical element of, of communication. Most salespeople, for example, or most negotiators are trained, I want to get to a yes. I want to negotiate and I know I have won the negotiation once the other person says yes. That's not true anymore. The reason is people just say yes to get the conversation over with. They don't want to be rude, so it's hard for them to say no. So personally, as a communications coach or as a salesperson, I don't want to hear the word yes. What I want to hear is the magic words, that's right. Why do I want to hear that's right from employees, from people that I sell to? Because they would only say that's right after listening to a summary. So if I summarize what has been said, what has been agreed upon, and then the other person says, that's right, I know I've got an agreement. I don't want to hear yes, yes, yes. Again, nodding, nodding, yes. That is just a quick way to make me stop talking. But if I summarize the whole meeting, what has been said, and then I ask, is that right? It also gives an opportunity for the other person to communicate any concerns or if I said something wrong, to correct me. So get a that's right. That is clear communication. That's an agreement. That's uh, don't just fall for yes. Now, again, um, it's been difficult to, to interact because, uh, as I said, my Facebook was hanging. So I hope you really kept that chat a room alive or the chat box and please do so now again i will for sure read the comments after and i'm sure the igp uh, will also do that because we would love to hear from you so now last exercise and please interact write down your one to three key learnings your one to three key learnings from this evening and i'm going to give you five minutes to do that Please start writing already while I speak. What is the one to three things that really stood out for you tonight? What have you learned? Most importantly, what are you going to apply? Don't worry about more things. Just what are the top one to three things that you consider valuable from this sharing and this discussion? Is it, for example, that the vision has to be co-created and clear, that I have to have a purpose, that uh, we have to have shared values that's really practical. Is it that we have to coach and manage and lead and that le leadership is different than management? Whatever it is, out of everything that's been discussed, in the chat, uh, please write down your top one to three key learnings, just in bullets. Uh, maybe communication has to be clear. You don't have to write a book. Just be clear. As I speak, please do that. And after this exercise, I will open the floor. Uh, I will just thank everybody. And then after that, I will open the floor for Q&A. So please get all your questions ready. Uh, I will be happy to spend a half an hour with you answering all your questions. Uh, there's no such thing as a wrong question. I'll do my absolute best to answer in a practical way. But for now, one, two, three key learnings the top things that you found valuable. It will also help me to improve my presentations. 
will also help the IGP to understand what you find valuable and what we can elaborate on, uh, maybe future courses. So one, two, three top things that you found valuable. Remember, there were seven ingredients. It was vision. It was hiring the right people. It was uh, purpose. It was a uh, shared value system. It was integrating goals with your values. Uh, it was clear communication, uh, coaching, leading, and managing performance. So I'll give you a minute or two more to write down in the chat your one, two, three key learnings. Please uh, use the chat while I'm speaking. Write it down. Keep the chat alive. We just love interaction. So please keep it alive. Uh, one, two, three key learnings. And then uh, one more slide after this. And then I'll open the floor for Q&A. One, two, three key learnings. Please keep that going. I know that there's a couple of hundred people in on this uh, learning session tonight. So I hope there's a couple of hundred comments. Um, one, two, three key learnings. So by the way, um, you can contact me directly if you are interested to know more about a high performance culture. There is my details. Um, I'm uh, doing something for free that's an email list where I just keep you informed about everything pertaining to a high performance culture. Uh, so please take a screenshot of the slide if you're interested to contact me, more than welcome to do that. And now, uh, before I go into the, the slides, uh, sorry, the last session, which is the Q&A, I just want to take the time before I forget because this is so important. I want to really show some gratitude, thank the IGP and all of you that participated tonight. Uh, I will definitely spend a lot of time tonight even and tomorrow reading all your comments. Uh, thank you so much for your participation. And most of all, I really am grateful to you because I cannot live my passion, which is to help people to grow as individuals and to grow their companies and make an impact in this world if you did not attend tonight. So I'm truly, truly grateful to you. But now, uh, entirely up to you. I hope you wrote down a ton of questions. I'm going to stop uh, sharing the screen. But uh, right after I do, I'm opening the floor for 30 minutes for Q&A. Uh, any questions that you might have, please be feel free to ask anything that you want. There's no such thing as a wrong question. Okay, so I have a question. Uh, thank you so much. I hope I pronounce your name correctly, uh, Le De La Cruz. How do we hire the right people? It's a very good question. And it's essential to our success to do that, to hire the right people. Now, as I said in the presentation, there is artificial intelligence out there. There's software out there that can help you to hire people accurately to a degree of 80%, meaning you can be 80% accurate in hiring the right people for positions that will stay there, that will perform. Um, uh, if you want, uh, you have my details, you can contact me. I can direct you to the companies that offer that service of using AI to hire the right people for you. You don't even have to have an interview anymore. Uh, the artificial intelligence is out there. I use it myself, it's highly accurate. So you don't have to go through the pain of asking questions and people just answering yes, 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 because they want the job. 
Um, also, a problem in hiring is that we have a lot of biases uh, as individuals. We think in our mind we want a certain person, uh, something that they say might just put us off and it might be personal. Uh, and, and artificial intelligence takes out all of that issues. And we think we might be good at hiring, but humans are not that great at it. We get it wrong. Uh, even if we are very good at people, at interaction, we often get it wrong to hire people. Uh, there's various companies that offer that service, and it's not that expensive. Uh, I would strongly advise that every company on this planet spend all their effort in hiring the right people. If you get that wrong, you have endless trouble. So I hope, uh, Leigh de la Cruz, that that answers your question. Which is more important, management or leadership? Uh, Pamela, I thank you for that question. A very good question. Uh, I would say, uh, but I'm biased, I must admit. I would say leadership because I'm so fond of people that have the ability to inspire, to uplift. But I'm careful in saying that because I think the reality is it's of equal importance. Because if you over lead, you only focus on leadership and you neglect neglect controlling people, neglect management, there's going to be chaos in your business. So I think it's of equal importance. Both must be present. And it's situational. In some situations, let me give you an example. If I'm in a war and bullets are flying over my head, I must immediately tell people next to me what to do. If not, they die. So I'll be straight. I'll control them. I'll tell them, move, do this, do that. Uh, so management in that situation is definitely uh, key. Uh, it's just an example. Uh, so it's situational, but there has to be equal measure of it. It has to be in balance in your business. Uh, it's a quite a difficult or challenging subject, but a very important one. I hope that answers your question. What to do to improve communication skill? That's, that's an excellent question, and I believe everybody has to do that because communication is key. Listen to this, please, and listen to this clearly. Communication is 80% of your success in any career, and this has been proven. doesn't matter whether you are in HR, whether you are in manufacturing as an industry, or whether you are in sales. doesn't matter what your role is. 80% of your career success is not dependent on where you studied, what your background is, but your communication skills. Communication skills is the future. How do I improve my communication skills? I can recommend the book. Uh, the author is Chris Voss, V-O-S-S, -S, Never Split the Difference. It's the best communication slash negotiation because communication is a negotiation. It's virtually the same thing. Sales is also a negotiation. Um, but my general advice, uh, Kiran, if I pronounce your name correctly, would be Commit to improving first, meaning an activity of at least 10 minutes a day that would improve your communication. Follow uh, the communication gurus on YouTube. Just you watch the YouTube videos. Chris Voss is one example. There's many others. Um, uh, other names don't come to mind right at the moment, but you can also contact me. I can send you or IGP. There's many uh, people that you can follow on YouTube. Uh, but the key thing to improving your communication skills is make sure you ask questions 70% of the time when you speak to anybody and 30% of the time roughly make statements. Great communicators are masters of questions and positive questions. Uh, again, a positive question is what can we to get, do together to improve the situation? A negative question is, why are you doing this? That, that's not helping me. That's a negative question. So if you ask a lot of positive questions with positive body language and with enthusiasm, that will improve your communication immediately. And as I said during the presentation, critical is your intent. 
whenever I know I'm going into a meeting and I'm going to communicate, I need to set my intent. I need to write down what do I need to achieve here? What do I need to say to achieve it? What does my body language need to look like? Uh, how should I speak? How should I address them? Ask the, your, those questions to yourself. Um, and it's like everything else. There will be gradual improvement, but if you put in the effort, uh, you will, will surely improve. But read works like Chris Voss's, Never Split the Difference. <clears throat> Watch the YouTube feature, videos of master communicators and ask a lot of positive questions. That, that will immediately help you to improve. There's lots more to it, but communication is a course by itself. Hope that that helps, Kiran. What are the qualities of the best employee? What is the qualities of a great employee? Uh, it's hard to answer because it's contextual. Uh, different employees, uh, in different sectors, in different roles, have to do different things. So I can only give a general answer. In general, firstly, attitude is the most important thing. I can be extremely intelligent. I can have 10 university degrees, but if I have a bad attitude, my impact will be neg negative in an organization. So the first thing is a a, as they say in Malaysia, a bolle attitude. I can do this. A positive attitude in general. Also, a solution oriented attitude, meaning I don't always just talk about the problems I have, I talk about solutions. I offer solutions. That's a very good employee. Another thing is an employee that truly believes in the vision of the company, they really feel the purpose. In this company, we had to make an impact and they love what the company is doing. Then their attitude is great. Then they want to learn. They want to take part. So I would say attitude and believing in the vision of the company. And thirdly, I would say a person that really wants to improve themselves and does the work to do that. It's easy to say I want to improve, but if I don't do the work, if I don't commit to improving, very hard to do. So uh, I think uh, your name is Kay. I hope that that answered your question. Great questions. Please keep it com coming. Then we have a question from Maria. Is leadership and management born traits or is it made? I'm very happy that you asked that question, Maria, because that's uh, what most people wonder about. Now, hopefully this makes you happy. Leaders are not born. Yes, there are people that are born with more natural leadership qualities. That is true. But here is the ultimate truth. And this is well backed up by research. Anybody can lead. Leadership is a decision. Now, the common misconception is that you have to have a title. Only the CEO can lead. Only the top management can lead. I have to be the sales manager to be able to manage and lead. That's not true. Because leadership is a behavior. It's not a title. So whether I'm a cleaner, whether I'm a receptionist, whether I'm the sales manager or the CEO, I can lead. Example, if I'm a cleaner, if I do my job to the best of my ability, I do it with enthusiasm. I know the purpose of this company. I add value to people. I greet them. I'm the friendly face that they see. I'm extremely helpful and I help other cleaners to improve their roles. I am leading them. So it's a behavior. Anybody at any time can decide to lead. And I hope after tonight, all of you decide to lead. It's wonderful to be able to inspire people. And at the same time, during this time of pandemic, especially the world needs strong leaders now more than ever. So read up on leadership and act. Then you're a leader. It's a, it's a decision. And you don't have to wait for somebody to give you a title. I hope that helps you, Maria. Great questions. If the payment and cost is higher in hired person, then is there any alternatives? Uh, 
Karma. I'm not sure I understand your question, um, but I'm, I'm going to try my best to answer. Uh, I think what you mean, uh, and please, if it's possible, uh, help me if I get this wrong. If it's extremely high cost to hire people or hire the, the right person, is there any alternatives? Yes. Um, if at all possible, start using the artificial intelligence that's available today, wonderful tools that will help your company a great deal. But if it's not possible for you to do that, you, if you are doing the interviewing or your HR manager is doing the interviewing, they must be excellent at detecting lies and you get human lie detectors. <laughs> and at the same time, make your interviews very practical. What I mean by that is if you ask questions like, are you a committed person? Of course, they will say yes because they want the job, but they might be lying. Are you a punctual person? That's common interview questions. Of course, they would say yes, but tomorrow morning they are late on their first day. So what makes it very hard for somebody to lie during an interview is to make them tell a or give practical examples of their punctuality, of their ethics. I'll give you a, a clear example. So in an interview, I would normally ask, um, are you good at handling conflict? And then they will always say, yes, of course. And I don't like this. I don't like this at all because it's just a way to make me stop talking. But then follow up question. Give me a practical example of a conflict that you resolved. Even give me the names in your story. Make that story very clear so that I understand it. Then it's extremely hard to lie. You can immediately see if somebody's making it up. Make it extremely hard for them to, to lie, to be blunt. Hope, hope that uh, helps you a little bit. Uh, Kim Ian, which leadership approach can be best applied to run a company uh, with a bit a twist of managerial approach? Uh, if I understand your question, it looks like how do you both lead and, and manage and what sort of leadership approach and include management? As I said during my presentation, it's critical that both is present, both leadership and management. You have to have controls such as KPIs, such as SOPs. It has to be there. That's management, that's control. Your financial systems, uh, your financial controls has to be there. But I will always advocate inspirational leadership. Does not matter what industry, manufacturing, uh, textile, doesn't matter what industry you are in. Inspirational leadership because people need to be inspired. I'll give a quick example. In Malaysia, a lot of CEOs that I have uh, coached, I'm not going to name names, told me that my employees are malas, which means lazy. There's no such thing. I totally disagree with it. There's no such thing as a lazy person, only an uninspired person, because show me a person that is inspired and lazy at the same time. So if you see lazy behavior, your fault as manager because you're not inspiring people. If you have the ability to inspire people, they will be inspired. They will work. Or you hire the wrong people. So I would always advocate inspirational leadership with your controls always in place, your financial controls, your safety controls, your daily reporting, whatever it is, must be there still. hope that, that answers your question. Mary Ann, uh, thank you for all the questions. It seems like it's really interactive. I'm really enjoying this. Thank you so much, Mary Ann. What are the characteristics of a good employee? I think we had this one before, um, but of course, integrity, critical. You have to hire people with integrity, people that don't lie, that follow backdoor policy, and also there's AI that can prove if, if a person has integrity or not. So firstly, hire for integrity. That is, that is so critical. Second of all, hire for enthusiasm. Somebody that truly wants to learn, that's truly here to improve themselves, that wants to grow with a company. And that can also be proven by AI, artificial intelligence. Um, and again, as I mentioned earlier during a previous question, it's truly about attitude. 
uh, employee, they can be great on paper. They can have 20 degrees, studied at Harvard, does not matter if they have a bad attitude that employee can bring your company down. So hire for a positive attitude, somebody that wants to share, contribute to the company, it's going to share ideas. I, In my career, I have stopped hiring people. I'm an entrepreneur as well. I've stopped hiring people that does not speak up during meetings, that does not contribute, that does not contribute positively. Um, and in the end, if I have to, I fire people that doesn't do that. That's just me. That's my opinion. But a good employee is one that contributes, that wants to learn, that has integrity, somebody that wants to grow and develop with a company that believes in what you are doing, what impact you are making in society. Uh, and somebody that's truly honest, honest about how they feel, honest about their mistakes, uh, honest about uh, asking for help. Come and help me. I don't know how to do this. So for example, if I work on a project, I raise my hand and I'm the first one to say, I am bad at A, B, and C. It's to help uh, to, and to receive help. If I don't admit my mistakes, so a good employee always admits their mistakes, then they receive help. But if I hide my mistakes, I don't get help and my mistakes makes the company suffer. So I hope that gives you a good idea, Marianne. Wilfred, another question. Thank you so much. How leadership affects management? Very good question. It's a complex question that would take a couple of hours to answer, so I'll do my best to do it in a minute. Um, so if leadership is toxic, meaning the leadership uh, of the company has a bad attitude, just hands down orders, just tells people what to do and is quite negative about it and uh, barks orders at people, then management will not be inspired. They will just be doing a job. They will just uh, be there for the salary at the end of the month. But if leadership inspires management, they give management all the tools that they require to succeed. They give them a clear vision. They give them support. They care about them. They make them feel good. They help them to share values. Then management is inspired. They want to do their work. They want to show leadership that we can do this. So leadership always affects management. It filters through, and it's actually elements of one thing. Um, management is the controls. So when I inspire people, the controls are always good and they understand what impact that controls has. For example, safety controls. If I don't implement proper safety measures as a manager, the vision of the company suffers. We cannot be the greatest company in Southeast Asia if our safety controls are poor, right? If a lot of people get injured on our sites, we cannot be the greatest company. So leadership is about vision and um, it drastically affects management. Hope that answers your question, Wolf Wolfred. Really enjoying this. Keep it coming. Uh, I love this group. Very interactive. How to become a successful businessman. Uh, hope I pronounce your name correctly. I'm a... Uh, Hamadula. Hope I, I did not attack your name there. I hope I said it right. How to become a successful businessman. Uh, that I can write a book about. There's so many elements to it, but I can just give you a quick uh, bit of advice there, Hamadula. The, the critical thing is creativity. It's about never giving up. Now, it's easy to say, but most business People don't become great businessmen or businesswomen because they give up too early. The first couple of problems they face or they have excuses such as I don't have money to start a business. You don't need money to start a business. Anybody can start a business um, without money. It's just you need to be resourceful. Uh, you don't have to have all the resources. You just have to be resourceful. So that's the first thing. Really be resourceful, meaning network. Your network is your net worth. The more people you know, the more you ask people to mentor you and help you, and the more you learn, uh, then you can become uh, successful. But there's so many things uh, 
uh, to it. Of course, you need to know the industry extremely well that you're getting into. So for example, um, if you're getting into the software industry, you must study that in industry inside and out. You must be able to answer any questions on the software industry. You must really commit to studying your field, your industry. Second of all, be really resourceful, network, uh, be creative, ask for help, ask for mentorship. Go to great business people, ask them to guide you. There are people out there that would do it for free because they want to give back. But there's about a hundred more things that I could tell you that makes up uh, uh, becoming a good businessman. But those are key tips. Be resourceful, network, never give up. And know your industry extremely well. Hope that helps you, Hamadullah. Okay, Anne has a question. What are the qualities of a good leader? There's many. I will just name a few. Um, a good leader believes, believes in the vision, truly believes it. It's not just words coming out of their mouth. We want to make a real difference in society. We want to uplift people. It's not just words. They believe it in their hearts. They speak about that vision, but most importantly, they act upon it. When they say they want to make a difference in people's lives, they go out there and they do it. They don't just speak about it. There's so many uh, politicians and leadership that just talk, 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 and there's no doing behind it. So leaders do what they say. So if you make a promise and you do it, and you do it with inspiration, and you have the ability to inspire other people with your stories, with what you do, uh, then you are a leader. But there's, there's so many things to it. I'll just quickly say, Kay, that a lot of people think to be a leader, you have to be an extrovert. You have to have a lot of charisma, right? Uh, you are born with it. That's not true. An example is um, I, I truly have passion for what I do. I'm an extreme, extreme introvert. Fifteen years ago, if you asked me to speak in front of people, even like now over over StreamYard or whatever, I would be hiding. I would uh, throw up even. But because I truly believe in purpose, in vision, I found the energy to do it. Uh, so get it out of your mind. You don't have to be an extrovert. You don't have to have all these qualities that other people tell you to have. Just have to believe strongly in a vision and take consistent action towards it and inspire other people with your action. It takes a bit of bravery, it takes a bit of guts, but all of what I've said now you can actually learn. Thank you very much, Kay, for, for your question. Hope that helps. Uh, Christine has a question How to become an effective and efficient leader of an organization? I love that distinction between efficiency and effectiveness. It's not the same thing. Let me be clear on this because this will help you a lot with management and leadership. Effectiveness is not the same as efficiency. Efficiency is doing the right thing. So, for example, if I have a business, doing marketing is the right thing to do. It's very hard to uh, uplift and improve my business if I do no marketing. So it's the right thing to do, right? But it doesn't mean I get any results. So if I'm efficient, I'm doing the right things, it doesn't mean that I'm actually getting the results I, I would like. Effectiveness means I'm doing the right things in the right way so that it produces results. That's totally different. So example, I'm doing marketing, that's the right thing, but now I need to take it a step further. I need to do it in the right way so that I get enough clients. So marketing do it, uh, done in the right way is to have the best copywriter. Have the best copywriter writing your ads. Copywriting is so important with, with ads. If you, you can have a beautiful ad, but the wrong copywriter, the wrong writing, you'll get no clients. So an effective ad advertisement is one that actually gets the results. So the question is, how do I get result and I do the right thing? So I have to do the right things in the right way. And you have to find out what that is. So, for example, um, 
I want to be a great business leader in the field of sales, for example, I have to communicate in the right way. I have to study communication until I communicate in the right way so that it produces the right results. So if you get the right results, you are effective. If you are doing the right thing, you are efficient. Uh, I know that's a complex answer, but it is a complex matter. I'll be happy, Christine, if you contact me to have a full discussion with you on that. It will take about an hour to fully explain, but, but great. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. We are, uh, we are grateful to you for your beautiful presentation, sir. Thank you so much. I really, I really do appreciate the time and also the platform that, that IGP has. Uh, I'm sure you're making a huge impact and hopefully globally. And I truly hope that tonight uh, makes an impact and a difference to some people at least. Thank you so much. Definitely, sir. Actually, uh, this session will really help our audience to do better in their personal and professional life. Again, thank you so much sir, for giving us your valuable time and share your knowledge with us. And dear audience, I would love to thank you for attending today's session. I hope you learned something new and will you will implement it in your life. Thank you so much for being with us. If our webinar helps you a little bit, a humble request to you that please leave a review and recommend on our page and spread the information with your friends. Our next webinar will be held on peak performance at 26th November at the same time. Hope to see you all there. Thank you so much. And thank you so much again. See you again with another uh, topics. Hopefully, I would love to be back on your platform. And uh, thank you so much to everybody for listening in. I really appreciate your time and hope to see you soon. Uh, and stay safe and healthy during this time of the pandemic. See you on the other side. Definitely, sir. Definitely.